Good afternoon, everyone. I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. This land always has been and always will be Aboriginal land. And it is really lovely to be here amongst so many friends, and especially my University of New South Wales comrades. There are few of us here today. <laughs> Uh, and I am really sorry that I couldn't be here all day. I was actually speaking at another rally in Town Hall this morning, which is about uh, stopping the government from introducing ag-gag laws. These are laws that will criminalize activists, starting off with animal welfare activists, and we've seen they move on to environmental activists or any other type of activists. Unfortunately, under Tony Abbott's Australia, there are so many fronts we are fighting on. Um, that it's kind of really uh, spreading us thin in a lot of ways, to be fair. And the only thing really to do is to boot him out as quickly as we can, I guess. Um, but coming back to the topic, a few months ago, um, I came across a Pakistani woman who was visiting Sydney. And she looked me in the eye and said, Australia is really backward. <laughs> a simple yet provocative statement. Um, and I, it actually sent me on a bit of a reflective journey. Um, and I like you to indulge me a little bit while I share that journey with you. So the woman who had actually um, delivered this verdict to me about Australia um, is quite a famous actor in Pakistan and she was here a few months ago as part of a delegation who were here to raise awareness about acid burn attacks on women in Pakistan and to actually um, gather some funds uh, for an organization which helps these women with reconstructive surgery, but also to help them reestablish through education. And they told us amazing stories about women who actually had had the surgery and who had studied and become lawyers, and many of them who actually are working in some, you know, some beauty salons, because this whole movement was started by a woman who runs a beauty salon. And it is, uh, many of you must be familiar with this horrendous and brutal practice that happens very often in Pakistan, India, across those countries where often very young women are actually held down sometimes by their own mother-in-laws uh, while acid is poured onto them and for reasons which are around not bringing enough dowry or maybe you know not having um, sons as children so it's like really reasons beyond their control not that it would uh, you know you would ever condone anything like this in any circumstance and the reasons she gave to me for her outburst included things like the high rate of domestic violence in australia because they had come earlier this year and we know you know e every week there's two women who are being killed by their partners this year uh, but she was also talking about the increase in gender pay gap in australia as well as of course everyone's heard the stories um, of the sexism that Julia Gillard faced as the first woman prime minister in Australia. And I must say I was really surprised by my kind of very immediate response to her, which was, no, that's not really true. <laughs> <laughs> Despite that niggling feeling in the back of my head that I was kind of defending something quite indefensible. Um, as many of you do know, I grew up in Pakistan, and Pakistan does lie at the very bottom of the global gender equality rankings list. It is a country that is struggling with poverty, it's struggling with terrorism and political instability. And, of, and this was really fueled very much um, by the patriarchal customs and misogynistic laws that were actually entrenched during the reign of a military dictator called Ziaul Haq. He, had, he actually uh, reigned from 1977 to 1988, and gender discrimination at that time became part of law in Pakistan in a big way. This was also the time kind of when I was going through high school and university, so very aware of what was going on in terms of women's rights in Pakistan. And I was lucky enough to grow up with, um, you know, kind of in the shadow of a very feminist aunt of mine. Um, and she kind of put me on a mission to defy this oppression and patriarchy. And one of the things that uh, I ended up doing was actually studying civil engineering. In defiance, truly, I didn't have much passion for civil engineering at that time. <laughs> I do love the profession now, so I practiced in, in there for, for, you know, for many years, but at that time, no, that was not the thing. It was just to show that women could actually do, do it, yeah, absolutely, and they should be able to do it. There should be no reason that they shouldn't. But even growing up in a progressive household, I have to say, you know, the cultural norms still prevail quite a bit, you know, the way, I was treated and my brothers were treated was quite different. Um, and, but I did pick and choose my battles. Um, I didn't give up playing cricket with the boys in the street. 
that was one of the things I was not going to give up. I refused to get married at 18 uh, when, you know, many suitable boys were making offers to my parents and my family to do that. And I can still so starkly remember these uh, whispering conversations between my mom and my grandfather. My grandfather saying to my mom, I would be completely <laughs> ineligible and no one would marry me if I was highly educated. <laughs> But anyway, my parents were good. They kind of listened to me and didn't give in. <laughs> um, and of course, I mean, I do realize that there is no comparison between the discrimination, disadvantage, and violence that women in Pakistan face um, compared to those in Australia. And statistics clearly show the situation is quite different. It's very dismal in Pakistan compared to anywhere else in the world, actually. Uh, but here's the conundrum. You know, living in Pakistan, I always did imagine, and everyone there does, because that's what we're told. Uh, we imagine prosperous, developed, rich countries like Australia to have actually achieved equality in every sphere of life. And indeed, one of the reasons for me moving to Australia was to live in a society that was supposedly free from discrimination and bias. Back in Pakistan, I was used to being one of the handful of you know, professional women engineers and really accustomed to gender disparities, used to fighting you know, for our rights. But having much higher expectations of Australian society, I was really shocked to arrive in Sydney um, and to discover when I started my master's degree at the University of New South Wales that there was only one woman academic. This is 1992 um, in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering amongst you know, 60 odd male teachers. And the situation hasn't changed at all in, in the 23 years I've been here. And there's still very few women in the engineering profession. And we know the situation is pretty dire in boardrooms and in parliaments. In fact, the upper house of New South Wales Parliament, where I sit, has only 10 women out of 42 members. Uh, and they've actually reduced by three after this election. So there used to be 13, now they're down to 10, much less. Um, than the 30% which, you know, research suggests is the minimum required to have any influence on decision making and political agendas. Um, and according to, uh, you probably come across this report already, a recent report by the OECD, our current federal government under Tony Abbott's <coughs> ministry, is one of the worst <coughs> in the developed world for gender inequality. The gap between women and men in ministerial positions um, is on the rise. We know there are only two women in Tony Abbott's ministry. We know the situation with the gender pay gap. 19% gone up by, I think it's almost 2.8% in the last two decades. And it's the highest it's ever been. Violence is in epidemic proportions, with two women, as I said, being killed every week in 2015. So clearly, Australia is not just lagging in gender equality, but frighteningly, we're really going backwards. So my friend from Pakistan was really right about this. And of course, part of the reason is in that vicious cycle of, you know, how do we start when there are not enough women um, in positions of influence? How, we, how do we change the situation? And of course, that needs to be addressed. But I think the other big part, which Susan talked about a bit, was um, sexist attitudes that are so entrenched in our society. It's incredible. It's really baffling to me coming from Pakistan and seeing um, really institutionalized sexism in the workplace. Um, across the board. And of course, you know, when we have a man as the Minister for Women <laughs> in Australia, I mean, it, it's, it's evident, it, you know, it, it has to be that way. And he proudly claimed his biggest achievement in this role was actually repealing the carbon tax because women are particularly focused on the household budget. Now, yeah, if you are on social media, I had a bit of fun that day, just reading all the tweets from people, and I just thought I'd kind of um, repeat some of them today. One was, thank God the pesky carbon tax is gone. Now we can all go back to ironing. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and another one, ironing done, household budget balanced. Oops, cook the planet. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> it, is, it is really preposterous that in the 21st century, um, we are represented by a man in Australia at the highest political level. So, as I said earlier, we've got to get rid of Mr. Abbott with the man at the helm of, and such small numbers in key positions, it will be very challenging to fix systemic and entrenched sexism in Australia. So then, you know, it really fascinates me now why in my youth 
I looked up to developed nations to lead the way. Because even then I knew um, that despite all the challenges that South Asian women face, we still had been at the forefront of political leadership while the United States still awaits the prospect of a woman president. Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, all elected women prime ministers decades ago. In Australia, as we all know, we got our first prime minister in 2010, but under incredible sexism from the media and her political opponents, she had a very short life. It's unfortunate, but it's true. It seems that Australia is just not ready for a woman leader at this point in time, and we've got to change that. Australia has also failed, of course, to acknowledge and redress the deep trauma and inequalities inflicted on indigenous women who were born the brunt of racist policies. Aboriginal female life expectancy sits at nine and a half years below non-indigenous women, and that is shameful. And we are all slowly but surely discovering the impacts of gendered racism in Australia, especially with the rise of Islamophobia. When there are moves to relegate Muslim women behind glass cabinets in the People's House, which is Australian Parliament, and when federal government MPs stand up and speak at Reclaim Australia rallies without any admonish admonishment from their leader, we know that things are definitely not okay. So upon reflection, my instinctive unwillingness to accept the truth about gender inequality and sexism in Australia was partly about defending my adopted country, but mostly a manifestation of the dominant view that I had grown up with. There was always the poor developing countries that had problems with gender, while rich developed countries like Australia had tackled and overcome these complex matters of inequality and injustice. My view of the world, now looking back, was really marred by crude generalizations and a Western supremacist narrative, which even filtered through to me in Lahore. Both sexism and feminism always have been and always will be, probably hopefully not sexism, but feminism will be alive and well in Pakistan and Australia, although to quite different degrees. There is also no doubt that women across the globe have the historical disadvantage of limited access to decision making. And we're still struggling to achieve equal representation in the workplace, in the boardroom, and in government. And we heard our stories from our Latin American friends as well. This is a universal struggle. And I think that's the important message that kind of I want to talk about today. This increasing trend of disadvantage can only be reversed if we stand together universally. And if we are honest about how things are quite different in different places, and we, if we are willing to learn from each other and not just imposing our worldview on everyone else, but actually learning from other places as well. And maybe some of the things that you know, women in Pakistan, women in Latin America are doing might work for us as well. At the end of the day, I think that's all that matters. It is the solidarity and the vigilance to keep progressing on removing entrenched and institutional sexism. And of course, though, I think rich nations do have to acknowledge that they are economically well off and they are better educated. So we need to put our own house in order and we need to contribute probably a lot more to helping others as well. Through the various waves of feminism, we have fought hard and we have won many battles. But the sad, sad fact is that we are moving backwards and uh, unwinding some of these hard fought rights. So I think it's time for a revolution. <laughs> it is time for the third wave of feminism, Amen. frankly, and a tidal wave at that. <laughs> and it is time to close the gap. Uh, and I might just finish off with one of my favorite sayings from Nelson Mandela. He said, it seems impossible until it's done. And we can do this. Thank you. <laughs>